What image comes to mind when you hear the word thug? Mobsters? Biker gangs? Street gangs? Maybe drug cartel? Maybe you're like me and the word thug prompts a mental picture of the late, great Tupac Shakur. Until I began preparing for this series, I had never pondered the origins of the word. And the origin happens to be more interesting than I could have expected and came from 18th century India. In 1765, in a city in central India, one of the world's most heinous and prolific killers was born, Baram Jamadar. Not much is known about Baram's childhood other than the fact that he was a quiet and shy child and was not known to be very social with others. In his preteen years, he became friends with one of the most notorious thugs of India, Saeed Amir Ali, who was 25 years his elder. Saeed introduced Baram to the world of Thuggy at just 10 years old. It wasn't until he was around 25, though, that he started his reign of terror on the people of India. Soon after his life of crime was established, he gained a group of nearly 200 thugs, due to which the territory of the central states of India had become terrified. The impact of Baram and his gang was so overwhelming that people usually had to change their ways to appease the gang of thugs. The leadership role Baram took upon himself eventually led him to obtaining the title King of Thuggy. Something that stood out to me was Baram's weapon of choice, a yellow handkerchief. That doesn't sound too deadly, but Baram modified his handkerchief to have a medallion sewn in the middle, which he used to place exactly over the Adam's apple, adding extra pressure on the throats of his victims to kill them. As per tradition, he, along with his gang, abstained from killing women, Muslim serfs, musicians, lepers, and Europeans. Their usual targets were traders, tourists, and pilgrims. Baram and his gang used to talk in different code languages as well. For example, Ramos was a word in which was used just before assaulting their victims. They would imitate the cries of Jackal to warn the other members of the arrival of a convoy. Hearing the cry, Baram and his gang would arrive with the yellow handkerchief. After killing and looting them, the bodies would be dumped into a well nearby. Baram and his thugs were devout followers of the goddess Kali and believed that all the murders they committed were merely a part of their religious duty. Baram gained a certain popularity that spread to England, which led the British to send five investigation teams to India to investigate. But after an intense examination, they could only publicly come out with the first name of lead thug Baram. Reason being, as Baram and his gang went back on their own rule of not killing Europeans and murdered all the investigators who had been sent. Soon after, the British government had to send a soldier named William Henry Sleeman to India for further investigation. In order to collect Baram's information, Sleeman had to move from one city to another, but he was still unable to gather any intel on him. Sleeman did receive a tip about Saeed's location, though, and soon British soldiers made their way to his supposed location. Saeed was warned of their advancement, so he quickly fled, and as a result, Saeed's mother and other family members were arrested by the soldiers. Meanwhile, Governor General of India, Lord William Bentick, equipped a team of investigators with security forces who were also attempting to put an end to Baram and his gang's reign of terror. Realizing that important people and convoys were going missing, James Patton, an East Indian Company officer, was put in charge to handle the case. In 1832, Saeed surrendered for the sake of his family and finally gave clear information about Baram's whereabouts to the British. By 1838, Baram was finally arrested. After the arrest, Baram revealed that he, along with his gang members, had killed nearly 931 victims with the help of that yellow handkerchief and medallions, of which 150 were killed by Baram himself. After narrating the stories of his crimes, the other members of his group were also arrested by the British soldiers. In 1840, Baram and his gang were executed by hanging, but Sleeman gave concession to Baram's newest and youngest gang members by sending them all to a reformatory. What's interesting is that all that gold, silver, and precious stones stolen by the gang have been buried and still have never been recovered. 
The location of this priceless loot still remains a mystery.